Hi everybody, welcome to the Gearin Report. I'm Michael Gearin and we have a busy show for you this evening. We head to the day at the Bay, the first group one for the season, the Tarzino. We find out what happens next with the stars, not only of wait for age grade, but for the three-year-old racing, some crucial punting information coming your way. Then the second part of our James McDonald interview. He was fantastic last week, so open about his career and his life. We find out more, including the question everybody wants the answer to, is he the world's best jockey? And last night in the wonderful Waikato, we crowned a new queen of New Zealand racing. We'll find out how the new horse of the year is getting on in her new career. All that on the Gearin Report tonight. Before we get into it, thanks for all your feedback and comments from our small team here over the last week. It's been a lot of fun to start our new show. We hope you are enjoying it. Let's get down to business because it was a massive day at the Bay and it wasn't a lot of fun for most of the favourite punters. We know Grail Seeker took out the Group 1 Tarzino, but back on the inside, in the daffodil colours, is Crocetti. So as Matt Cartwright was rising to Group 1 glory, Crocetti was having a career worst performance. Spoke to Danny Walker, his co-trainer today. He said, look, we think the horse got out of his comfort zone in the hectic first 400 metres. Australia is a no-go. No stamp in the passport for Crocetti. He goes to the spelling paddock and he is a surprise. He is going to be set for a sprinting summer. That could mean the Concord into the railway and sprint features. Maybe the Telegraph for Crocetti, not extending out to the 14 or 16 until the BCD sprint at Tarapa in February. This market is crucial. Orchestral heads to Ellerslie tomorrow. If she turns up in the arrow field, she will be the favourite, but Roger James saying she's 50-50 to be there. They have the option to go to a group two in Sydney. Why that's crucial? Well, she's not actually in a trial tomorrow. She's in a jump out after the trials because they're only allowed to trial 120 horses. We could lose orchestral out of this field and very quickly grail seeker. Lance O'Sullivan is suggesting to me, Believe it or not, the Golden Eagle for $10 million is now potentially on her dance card. If that's the case, we lose the second favourite. Third favourite Mustang Valley will only be there if it's wet. If it's not wet, we lose Mustang Valley. Very quickly, the top three in this market could disappear. We know Malt Time can go. She was really good at Ruakaka on Saturday. But here's the surprise. Skew Whiff, who's been kept predominantly to a sprinting diet since winning the Tarzino last year and found the line so well there, in fourth, is going to the arrow field. She's gone to Waikato Stud. She's having a bit of a break at home. She's coming back. Mark Walker confirming to us she will be in the race. That's your bet. $7 won't last for her. She's being aimed at the race. She gets OP Bosson. Tick, tick, tick. I said to Mark, 1600 he said, we think she can handle it. She was placed twice at 1,600 at the top level as a three-year-old. So that's the big news out of the Arrowfield market. 50-50 for orchestral, no for a couple of others, weather dependent for a couple more, and skew with now heading there. The $7 with the bookies will not last. Let's talk about the other features out of the bay on Saturday. And poetic champion, too big. Too fast off the front in the El Roca Kotsur Colin Meads Trophy. Matt Cartwright making his mark on Tarzino Day. Really good. Tony Pike saying, look, we'll go to the Hawks Bay Guineas. Of course, we have to go to the Hawks Bay Guineas now. But I'm still not sure he's a 1,600 metre horse. They were Pikey's words. So he'll go to the 1,400 of the Hawks Bay Guineas if... That works out. Yes, they head to Rickerton for the 1600, but Pikey's thinking he might just be a little bit too quick for that. The other big news out of the race, move to strike. Had trot-ups this morning at Tiakea. They were inconclusive, nothing wrong with the horse. He's fine, but we'll give him more tests and they'll work out whether he is still spot on for the spring. No decisions made with move to strike until he next gallops on Saturday. Here's Alabama Lass being all awesome in the gold trail. Now she will head to a 1400 next up, probably the Sarton one would suggest. And then she has the option 
to go to 1600 at Rickerton, if of course she handles the 14. News out of the race, captured by Love, who ran second. It was very brave. She is on the 1000 Guineas path. Yes, she will be going to Rickerton, all things going well. But I tell you who won't be the third horse, the Mask Rose. Excellent when running third, but Mark Walker confirming today she is heading to the paddock. A little bit of a surprise there. He said she's still a touch frail. We don't want to overtax her. No Damask Rose for the Thousand Guineas. That is guaranteed. She heads to the paddock and then she can go through the summer races and maybe onto something like the Caracamillion Million three-year-old. So big changes in some of those markets. Some yeses, some nos and some weather-dependent horses. Not only for the second day at the Bay, September the 30th, but of course for those Rickerton features and then Allersley, which lies ahead. Last week we were enthralled by some of the thoughts of our champion jockey, our world champion jockey, James McDonald. We spoke to him about some of the things happening in his future and we asked him that question as Kiwis we want to know the answer to. James McDonald, are you the best jockey in the world? Do I think I'm the best jockey in the world? Um... If you, if you ask me that when, I'm, when you're legging me up on a horse, yes. But to uh, ask me now who I think the best jockey in the world is, uh, I'd have probably one or two in front of me, that's for sure. And Ryan Moore being one, because he's, he's just phenomenally so, so good and fearless and um, he's not scared to make a mistake, which obviously that comes with um, the territory of riding such good horses as well as... Uh, having belief and you're making the right decisions with her and getting away with it but uh, and that comes with experience so um, it's hard to say um, to a young fella you should have done this or shouldn't have done that when you're not in the same position as a as a Ryan Moore or something like that so who can obviously make those mistakes and get away with it at times. How do you get on with Ryan because you do have a, a link up through Coolmore mm -hmm. to people watching from the outside and he seems very truculent and and doesn't seem the warmest person on earth. How do you get on? No, I get on with him really well. He's um, like we're on, on dialogue all, quite often because he flies in, flies out for Coolmore and obviously with the Coolmore partnerships that are forming here in Australia or here in Sydney, he obviously flew in for Storm Boy and I was riding Storm Boy p before that and um, there was, there's been other scenarios too but he's so knowledgeable about a racehorse, it's scary. And um, and he's he's so good to pick his brains, and he's he's very uh, open to helping you out wherever he can. Whether you're second best jockey or the best jockey in the world, it, it doesn't matter with him. And because um, I reckon he he'd sit comfortably in his, in his own seat and say, oh, "I'm the best jockey." Let's talk about then. Say you had someone riding one for a fortune, a horse you owned, mm. and you couldn't ride it. Who would you want to ride it for you? I presume after that conversation in Europe or the UK it would be Ryan, but would that be the same in all jurisdictions? For example, Flemington versus Hong Kong. Uh, well, that's a yeah, great scenario. You could go to any country in the world and they've all got their, their particular jockey that's very, very strong. And we, we look at just Opie. He, he can pick up his helmet and stick and saddle and travel anywhere and be as good as anyone on the day. And he, he's a great, when the big races are on, you'd be love to throw him the helmet for sure. And uh, and then obviously, Ryan's Ryan's one of those jockeys that, like, he, he, amazing how he does it from England to Ireland, France, to America, to Australia. Like he's, he's ridden there probably twice a year, wins a Cox Plate in the Melbourne Cup and flies down for a slipper and wins that as well. So obviously the cattle, it's not. We're all lucky enough to ride those sort of horses, and um, that helps immensely. But you still got to turn up and do it, and you still got to work to get yourself in that position to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, he's probably the one. What that about locally? What about the Australian jockeys? If you couldn't ride one, you had the favourite in the slipper. You couldn't ride it yourself. Oh, Huey Bowman. He's just been a class act for so long, and you know what? He even though he's a really good friend of mine. Um, He's one person like I really idolise and how he approaches things. I sat next to him for the four years Winx was going for a cox plate. Like, I mean, like, that's his locker, I'm on this locker. And 
I was stressed for him. And I was thinking, well, how the hell is he going through what he was going in? He just, obviously there was times where he probably did get nervous, but we all get nervous at those sort of scenarios and, and how he approached things. And I, I reckon I'm, I'm a better competitor for that and just just watching what he was doing and how he was coping with it. In those situations, is there any talkies or do you leave him to be? No, there? I just left him. And we're really good mates and he, I just left him to be. And... Um, I remember the Friday before the Cox Plate, uh, the fourth Cox Plate, he, he just rang me out of the blue and said, Mac, do you want to go and have a hit of golf? And me and him, just the two of us, he just needed an escape for what was... what was. Did you talk about the rest? Nah, nothing. <laughs> so we played, 18, we played 18 holes around Capital, and, um, and it, was the, it was the best ever. He was, he was, Who won? Oh, he probably did. He, he always gets my cash. He's a good golfer though. He's sharp as a tack, and if he if he had more money on it, he'd probably dial in even more. But he's a he's just a good sportsman. You recently won your sixth premiership. Does winning a premiership still sit anywhere close to the top of the priorities list, or is it a nice thing to defend on your stomping ground? Yeah, it is because um, I, I've found that. Um, the more you win, the more you want, and the more someone wants to take it from you. So um, that fire's still there to win it. And every year I sit out, well, if I'm based here in Sydney, I'll be sitting to win the premiership because not only it means something and it's great to have on your CV, so to speak, because it's such a tough jurisdiction um, to ride in and it's so competitive. But if uh, you're not winning or, or competing for a premiership, you're not riding enough winners. And so I look at it at, at a bit like a, a broader thing. And the, uh, the other thing it probably holds in great value is that when you're at the peak of the powers competing for the premiership, you're the, basically the first board of call for an owner, a trainer. So it gives you a bit of a leg up onto good horses as well. So um, to win my sixth in a row, eight overall, it's been a... Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that, and 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 the other thing is, it's um, it's it's great because I've been consistent for so many years here in Sydney, and I treat Wednesday meetings as good as Saturday meetings. So um, I think that's something to hold my head eye on. Let's talk about consistency because it's one thing to win big races; you need the right horse to do that, but to have that body of work consistently being that good. What skills or mental tricks or drive have you had to develop or hone to keep being that consistent? Yeah, it's a good question because, um, <clears throat> oh, as everyone knows, over time things change, your body changes, um, injuries creep in. So, from this, from when I look back 12 years ago, so I used to just go hell for leather, ride as many meetings as possible now it's a bit more reserve um, I pick and choose sort of meetings like I did five years ago and my training regimes are probably a bit more intense five years ago than it was than it is now um, it's going to sound pretty corny or something now but I do I do a lot of Pilates and Bikram yoga and and not do as much strenuous gym work as I used to and so just trying to move with the times, doing less work but more, if that makes sense. And um, I find that's working with me. Um, this year, in particular, I had three stints on the sideline due to injury, um, broken, broken toe, a foot, and um, I just had a bit of a niggling issue in, internally. So um, obviously, I, I'm only 32, and it sounds like, sounds like I'm not that old, but in sport. Obviously, injuries creep in, and um, yeah. So I'm just trying. I'm trying to move with the times and play around with certain things like Pilates and Bikram yoga and, and stuff like that to really try and get some longevity out of my career. I read an interesting article recently on Mark Zara, who said he doesn't want to ride at 54 much anymore because he doesn't ride as well. His body yep. and his brain doesn't work as well at 54 yep. as it does at 57. I'd never heard that comment before. Do you feel the same about your body and your weight? 
Yeah, well, I, I suppose we all pick our marks and, and we all know our bodies and, and what we can and can't do in terms of pushing yourself to the limit. I find, look, the, the heavier you ride, the, the heavier you are, the better you're going to ride, obviously being not as dehydrated or, or fatigued. But um, I've, found, I've found myself in a happy medium. I, during the carnivals, I can um, quite easily get down to 55 and, and I feel I can ride at a really top-notch level at that. Um, like I could tighten the screws a little bit more if I had to for a, a cup or something like that. But um, I, I find between 56 and 55 is my sweet spot. And obviously off carnival time, I'd, I'd like to be a little bit heavier. But yeah, it's just it's preference and how, how much you want to push yourself and obviously the horses you're riding. You have ridden the winner of almost every race an Australian jockey would dream of winning, but there's one obvious one you haven't won. Caulfield Cup? Yeah, Caulfield Cup. Does it yeah. feel like it's a race that's got away a little bit on you because of COVID or different things? You know what, I've been real stiff in it, to be fair. I, um, the, the, well, we, we can't ride in it now because the, well, we can, but the Everest is on the same day as well as the King Charles, which is obviously such a prestigious race as well. So the Caulfield Cups, um, unless I've got a, like a twos on chance to get there, I probably won't be riding it anytime soon, but I rode a Stunning filly called Rising Romance, shot clear with about a hundred to go and this Japanese come flying over the top, beating a pimple. So and that was for Donna Logan, which obviously would have meant a lot to you. Huge yeah, yeah, huge Kiwi connection. And then the um, the year before that was Dear Demi and she finished she she went through look looked like she was gonna win as well and run third. So I've had a bit of luck in the race but just haven't been able to nail it. But um yeah, hopefully as everyone knows, it's the Grand Slam, part of the Grand Slam circuit, and um, to add it to the CV would be huge, you know. This January just passed, you went home to Ellerslie, one of your favourite tracks, and rode the winner of both Karaka Millions. What was that like? Does it still mean as much now, when you are going to Hong Kong and to Ascot in Japan, to go home to your mm. home track and do that for people who have known you since you were in school. She gets goosebumps thinking about it, but no, it, it was one of my highlights of the year. I, I don't know why, because obviously it's, it wasn't a group one, but um, the meeting, meaning to it was hugely significant due to the fact that it was my first trip home. Um, like I said before, the expectations enormous, um, not only through the punters, but the horses that I was riding as well. I was lucky enough to partner up with Velocious, Stephen Marsh and Roger James with Orchestral, which, which like going back 15 years, these guys put me on the map mm. with their horses. So to go back and ride for them for so long, since so long, um, it was a really good buzz. The night was fantastic. To get one result was awesome, but to get two was brilliant. It's Velocious in front for the Go Racing Colours and she's home for J-Mac. Wins the TAV Kanaka Millions. Orchestral's looming large for J-Mac. Orchestral went to the lead, shut the gate. J-Mac's back in town. Orchestral has bolted in. He goes all right, this bloke, doesn't he? McDonald. What a brilliant night they've put on and it's so good to be a part of it and rap to come back and to get a couple of winners is even better. I could safely say it was one of my highlights of the year. I know that sounds funny and you're probably thinking I'm just, just saying that for speaking to you, but it did set rung home. <laughs> it was cool. Everybody in racing keeps suggesting that James McDonald's going to end up in Hong Kong. Maybe the replacement for Zach Purden, not your, your own man, Zach's his own man. Do you want to live in Hong Kong? Do you want to, to ride there full time? Uh, yeah, well, it's definitely an option. It, it will happen one day. There's no point beating around the bush. And but at the moment, with realistic goals here and things I want to achieve here, it's um, I want to get them done first. And if I can, is the one twenty nine one of those? Yep. And and then obviously we will. Um, things change though, as you know, in in the racing, and um, so I'm open to anything. But there's no doubt I'll end up riding there. Uh, eventually, it's a great jurisdiction. The racing's so so competitive. The prize money is unbelievable, and yeah, it's a, it's a great atmosphere to compete at. Whether you're on a happy belly on a Friday night or on a Sunday at Sha Tin, the atmosphere is phenomenal. And 
we just go back to obviously um, being well received there. It's one place that I that I am um, very well received. Yeah. You talk about it being a tough jurisdiction, but you ride in a lot of tough jurisdictions. Where's the hardest place to turn up? Hong Kong, Melbourne Cup Week, the Championships, the Everest, or in fact, Japan or Ascot, uh, where the Ascot jockey's room seems to be very stacked. Yeah. So where's the hardest place for you to ride? It's a good question. It's um, it's all in relation to, I suppose, what you're riding and, and that. But I enjoy... Like I've just come well, not long ago back from Japan. That was a great experience. I had a lot of fun and and learned a lot through that experience as well. But probably the toughest, I don't know. It might be might be New Zealand, just with the expectation that comes with riding back home. But um, where overseas is a little bit different. But yeah, the toughest. Do you still see yourself as a kid? Toughest. But when you go to it, going back home. Are you still a New Zealander or are you a half and half these days? Uh, probably. You'd probably say you're half and half. Everything's here. My family's here now. and um, Even though I don't get back often enough, and which is probably a little bit of a regret because our life's so busy and it's hectic all the time. But um, when I do go home, I just love it. So that's always going to be there, I think. What about two beautiful daughters? How does that change who you are? Um, well, it's a lot more hectic, especially in the, in the household. That's for sure. We uh, obviously were lucky enough to um, purchase an, a, a big house, and we were there's just two of us there for a bit, so it was pretty lonely. But now we've got two little rugrats running around. It's it's pretty nuts. Um, Caitlin Caitlin does an amazing job. To be fair, um, like you said before, she's been in it. She, she knows um, what's required to maintain a certain standard I suppose in my riding or my occupation and um, she just deals with basically everything that I can't or, or don't feel like doing on that day because I suppose um, being a sports person as bad as it sounds it's a very you're a very selfish sort of um, it comes with a lot of sacrifices and you're know, quite you like I'm always training or always doing form or always looking for the next sort of thing. So um, Caitlin really understands that, which is so important and oh, well, she's very grateful for that. And she looks after basically everything, <laughs> everything else, which is remarkable. So she's been an unbelievable mum and the two girls have just, every day something's different happening. So it's, it's been like pretty cool to see Evie Obviously, she came to Hong Kong last year. She loved it, and uh, this year will be even different because she's a year older. Um, so yeah, watching them grow up, it's just crazy because I could shoot away. I was in Japan for a week, come back, picked her up from daycare, and it's like she'd grown and just her whole foresight was nuts. Little sponge. Yeah, she's just so cool, and she loves she loves life. And you look back and go. God, you haven't got a care in the world and you're just living the dream and here we're slaving away. Life's good. 32, one of the best jockeys in the world, depending on who you ask, including yourself. Yeah, for sure. Money's coming in, beautiful family. What does a good version of James McDonald's life at 42 look like? Mm, don't know. That's a, that's a tough question and a hard... Um, Interesting question because I, to, to give you a short answer to that, I actually haven't thought about it. Would forty-two-year-old James McDonald still be riding? Um, well, you know what I, I said to myself at twenty, I'll get, I want to get to thirty and buy a dairy farm. I've got to thirty, now I want to get to forty. So I'll be interested to see what the next one is. But I would hope, as long as I can maintain a good level and competitive and and the juices are still flowing um, I'd definitely like to be riding at 42 yeah for sure that gives me another yeah I'd like another 15 goes at winning another Melbourne Cup <laughs> Hi 
We thank James McDonald for letting us into his life. Key takeaways, yes, one day to Hong Kong. Uh, yes, he is kind of the best jockey in the world alongside Ryan Moore and he should be riding for the next 10 years, which is great news for punters as he chases down that one, two, nine. From big interviews, next week we go to big issues. We're going to have an in-depth look into Ellerslie, what went wrong, what we're hoping to happen for this new season as they get very close to returning to the track September 21. But last night, we crowned the new Queen of New Zealand Racing. Horse of the Year was Imperatriz. She claimed three titles in all. We thought we would check out with Harry King, a New Zealander working at Yulong, how the Queen is getting on. Uh, thank you, Mick. Uh, it's, uh, here we have a very special guest for your show uh, tonight. Um, the champion, uh, multiple champion, 10-time Group 1 winner, uh, Imperatriz, a, uh, a farm favourite as she now embarks on her second career as a broodmare uh, at Yulong but in terms of her championship uh, title she's just claimed, uh, it's a team effort from everyone involved from the, the farm that farmed her to the, the people that broke her in and of course uh, the whole team at Te Akeo, uh, David, Karen, Jamie Richards who initially trained her and and on to Mark Walker and, and Ben Gleeson and, and all the other connections involved with her. And now we're very, very fortunate to uh, announce that she'll be covered by our, our young and emerging Group 1 winning siren, Pierrada. Uh, we're very excited to see that and uh, looking forward to what might come this time next year with hopefully a, another update. And on behalf of uh, the Zhang family, Yulong, and everyone involved here at the farm, we're very proud to have her. So, best of luck to all the breeders in New Zealand for the season coming up. And um, as I said, hopefully this time next year, we've, we've got some great updates and, and some news for you on a, a mini berry. Yeah, thanks to the team at Yulong and Imperatriz, well into the next phase of her career. Uh, congratulations to all the winners last night. It was ladies' night at the Horse of the Year. So many of our fillies and mares getting recognition, but also to Peter and Dawn Williams, who won the outstanding contribution to New Zealand racing. Next week, that deep dive into Alizy. Looking forward to giving you that. If you want to get back to us with some feedback, join us on X at Garen Sports, or as they used to call it, Twitter. And don't forget, the NZB catalogue for the ready to run sale the best ready to run sale in the world is launching right now on monday night after the gear and report you can pop across to nzb.co.nz to see who goes under the hammer in november thanks for watching we'll be back with plenty more gear and report next monday